We're coming up on conference tournament season, a time that's not so secretly just as exciting as the first weekend of the NCAA tournament, if not even more so. Yeah, I said it. Over the course of two weeks or so, almost every team in the country faces off in their own smaller brackets to determine who ends up on the big one. Every D1 conference receives an automatic bid to the NCAA tournament, and all 32 of them agree that the bid should go to whomever wins the conference tournament. Unless you're ineligible. Sorry, Bellarmine. But what do these tournaments look like? Most of them look like normal brackets, or at least as close to normal as possible given the number of teams involved isn't an exponent of two. Some conferences elect to exclude the teams at the bottom of the standings from their tournament. Of course, there's the Ivy League, who didn't create their tournament until 2017, and even then only invited four of their eight teams. I don't love this, but you do you. In any case, this type of bracket seems fair. Each team has to win the same number of games to claim the bid, with lower-seeded teams getting the short end of the stick in cases of asymmetry. Some conferences add another round of buys to give the highest-seeded teams a bit more of a lift. The Big Ten, for instance, extends a 14-team tournament to five rounds by giving its top four seeds a double buy. This makes it harder for a conference bottom dweller to fall backwards into an auto bid, which is really annoying if you're a Minnesota fan. But a few conferences go even further. They don't view buys as a coincidence born of an uneven bracket, they view them as a necessity. They add as many buys as they possibly can. This is what's known as a double ladder. Here, seeds are paired up and every pair gets one more buy than the pair below. No matter how many rounds there are, the top two seeds don't play a game until the semi-finals. The WCC uses this format, and because Gonzaga always gets that bye to the semis, they've become infamous for it. The entire concept seems anti-competitive. Why should the lower seeds even bother to show up if they have to win three straight games just to run into a buzzsaw? As a result, many fans hate it. And if the WCC was their introduction to the double ladder, I can't really blame them. But I actually love this format. In fact, I think more than half of D1 conferences should be using it every year. This is a somewhat unpopular opinion, I know. But I've got the data to back it up, and 15 minutes from now, I think you'll be on my side. To explain why the double ladder is such a good bracket, I should first establish a baseline for what makes a good playoff format. This is mostly subjective, but there are generally two schools of thought. I'll call them Team Quality and Team Chaos. If you're on Team Quality, you think the playoff should reward the best teams. You think the regular season has to matter for something, why else would you play all those games? You were probably opposed to the recent playoff expansions in MLB, the NFL, the NBA, and college football, and you hate when a lower seed catches lightning in a bottle and wins what you believe to be an undeserved championship. If you're on Team Chaos, you think the playoff should provide the best entertainment. You think if they wanted to give the title to the best regular season team, they could just do that without having a postseason tournament at all. You were probably in favor of postseason expansion because more playoff games means more high-stakes viewing experiences. You love seeing the little guys get a shot on the big stage, and you live for upsets. Objectively, the NCAA tournament appeals to Team Chaos. No tournament that held the regular season in high regard would allow UMBC to beat Virginia. But the highest seeds almost always cut down the nets, so team quality ends up happy too. The near-perfect combination of the two is what makes March Madness so popular. But what about conference tournaments? On the surface, it seemed like a standard bracket would appeal to Team Chaos, and a double ladder would appeal to Team Quality. But a look at the underlying data tells a different story. Remember last year when I sifted through every conference tournament result ever to find the five biggest blowouts? I recently updated that data set to include 2022, giving us 9,273 conference tournament games since 1985 when the NCAA tournament expanded to 64 teams. I looked at every game's absolute seed difference, or how far away the two teams were seeded from each other, and from there I calculated the average margin of victory and how often the lower seed pulled off the upset. As you'd expect, the closer the two seeds, the closer the game, and the likelier the upset. 
Consider a standard 8-team bracket here. The 4-5 game would have a seed difference of 1, so the average game would be decided by about 9 points, and the 5 seed would have about a 41% chance of winning. The 1-8 game would have a seed difference of 7, making the average MOV about 14 points and giving the 8 seed a less than 13% chance to shock the world. The upset percentages are honestly lower than I expected across the board, especially given the wide majority of these games are played on neutral courts, and the difference between a 4 and a 5 seed is sometimes as slim as a tiebreaker. Perhaps this is a quirk of higher seeds getting more buys and being more well rested, but the data is clear. Having a higher seed matters quite a lot, and that 4.5 point gap between a 1 seed difference and a 7 seed difference? It might not seem like much, but as an average in a data set of several thousand, that's actually a huge leap. Think of it this way, the average 1-8 game is a blowout. Nobody wants to watch blowouts, and the higher seed has nothing to gain and everything to lose from playing in them. Compare this to how an 8-team double ladder would look. The 8 seed would start out playing the 5, a seed difference of 3 that allows for a much more entertaining game and more than double the chance of the 8 seed winning. If it does, it faces the 4 seed in the next round, and we're rewarded with another game of similar quality. If it doesn't, the 5 seed plays the 4, and we're treated to a seed difference of 1. Even better, the other side of the bracket starts out with that seed difference. With the lowest seeds having such good odds to make a run, this bracket is tailor-made for Team Chaos. Of course, Team Quality also loves it because the top two seeds, the Team Teams that performed the best throughout the regular season only have to win two games instead of three, and their level of competition in the semifinals is somewhat lower. So the double ladder is superior to a standard bracket for both Team Quality and Team Chaos. It's great for fans, but the numerous conference executives watching this video probably don't care about that. So let me tell them what they need to hear. I'll make this clear from the jump. The double ladder makes it easy for one of your top two teams to claim the auto bid. If you're a league in which your best team routinely qualifies for an at-large, this is not in your best interest. Most of the time, you would want your top team to lose, so someone else can claim the auto bid and you can get another team in the big dance. Power conferences need not apply. Even the WCC, the league notorious for this format, has no business using it. Gonzaga is one of the best teams in the country almost every year, and they'd easily get at-large bids all the time if they weren't too busy hogging the WCC auto bid. This isn't to say that Gonzaga wouldn't win the conference tournament if it used a standard bracket, but by making it so easy for teams that were already NCAA locks, the WCC is leaving bids on the table. You hear that, WCC tournament haters? You're 100% right. Of course, most leagues aren't like this. Each year, about 20 out of 32 conferences only send one team to the NCAA tournament. And for these one-bid leagues, it's crucial that they send one of their best teams, because better teams get higher seeds, and higher seeds win more games, which means more money for your conference. That much is obvious. What isn't obvious is just how much of a statistical advantage you get for sending one of your top two seeds. Let me break it down. In every year since 1985, for every league whose only bid was their auto bid, I pulled the conference tournament tournament seed of the auto bid winner, their resulting NCAA tournament seed, and what round of the NCAA tournament they ended up reaching. I then further restricted it to leagues whose only bid got an 11 seed or worse in the NCAA tournament. Because if your champion got a 10 seed or better, you weren't truly a one bid league. Your best team almost certainly could have lost in the conference tournament and still gotten an at large, thereby giving you multiple bids. Heck, some leagues have sent only one team and had that team get a one seed. Anyway, here are the results. The first thing you should notice is that higher conference tournament seeds generally get higher NCAA tournament seeds, though the lower you get, the smaller the sample size. The next thing you should notice is that higher conference tournament seeds generally get farther in the NCAA tournament. But in both cases, look at how neatly this data breaks into seed pairs. No conference tournament seed below 2 has ever earned an 11 seed or reached the Elite 8. No seed below 4 has ever earned a 12 seed or reached the Sweet 16. No seed below 6 has ever earned a 13 seed or reached the round of 32. Two. Well, almost. Furthermore, let's look at that March Madness performance on a rate basis. Conference tournament 1 and 2 seeds have a clear advantage over every other seed in how likely they are to win a game in the field of 64. Here's what happens when you group the data by seed pairs. If you're a one-bid league and one of your mid-table teams wins the bid over one of your top two seeds, you're cutting your chance of reaching the round of 32 by more than half before the game has even started. The conclusion is clear. The double ladder would reward seeds almost perfectly based on how well they perform 
perform in the NCAA tournament. Going back to quality versus chaos, this is perfect for both sides. One bid leagues earning better auto bids leads to more chaos in the big dance. You get the best of both worlds. In conference tournaments, the higher seeds can chill it out, take it slow. Then they rock out the show in the NCAA tournament. And besides, this is how it's supposed to work. Bear with me for a minute. It's September 30th. The MLB regular season has just ended, every team has played 162 games over the past six months, and it's time for each of the six divisions to decide whom they're sending to the playoffs. Every division does it a little differently. The NL West eliminates its worst team and just holds a four-team tournament for one spot, but their top two teams are good enough to earn wild cards, so they're secretly hoping their third place finisher takes the berth. The AL Central holds a single ladder tournament that takes four days to complete. Of course, there's that weird antique division in the Northeast that used to send its regular season champion, but recently started holding a one-game playoff between its top two teams. You can probably see where this is going. Obviously, it's not a one-to-one -one comparison, but this is basically how college basketball conferences choose who makes the NCAA tournament. It's antithetical to how the postseason normally functions in American sports. Everywhere else, if you've played well enough to make the playoffs, you just do. You don't have to prove it in some random winner-take-all kangaroo court after the fact. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not advocating for an end to conference tournaments. They wouldn't make any sense if college sports were anything like pro sports, but they're not. The seasons are a lot shorter, the schedules are a lot less balanced, and a key injury for just a game or two could decide a regular season title. Aside from that, conference tournaments are a ton of fun, and they make people a lot of money. They're obviously not going anywhere anytime soon. But for one-bid leagues, only one team gets the chance to shine on the national stage, and I do think you should have a big advantage to receive that chance if you dominated in the regular season. In other sports, it's not unheard of for fringe playoff teams to play at the beginning of the postseason in a play-in that feels disassociated from the rest of the playoffs in spirit. The NBA has the play-in tournament, MLB used to have the one-game wildcard, even in college basketball the four worst at-large teams play in that weird fever dream on True TV. These formats all deliver A-plus high-stakes excitement because they feature equally matched teams playing for their lives right off the bat. With the double ladder, you get this atmosphere in two nested layers. First, the lower seeds have to play themselves into a shot at taking down the higher seeds, then the higher seeds have to play themselves into the NCAA tournament. Not only that, but with the chance for the top seeds going down in the first round removed, conferences can stop being cowards and invite more of their teams to the tournament. And with so many equally matched games, it's non-stop excitement. And one conference seems to have this all figured out already. The Western Athletic Conference is probably most famous for literally being called the WAC, but it shouldn't be, because recently, they've tried some of the most experimental conference tournament formats any league has ever used. The WAC kinda fell backwards into using the double ladder. For most of the 2010s, depending on their membership, they either used a standard 8-team bracket or a shortened version with just 7 teams. They didn't play their tournament in 2020 because of that whole disease thing, and they'd planned on going back to the 7-team format in 2021, but Chicago Chicago State ended up canceling their season in December, leaving them with just six teams for the tournament. The result? A de facto double ladder. Meanwhile, the WCC announced halfway through their season that they were changing up their tournament seating to account for so many games being cancelled. They'd commissioned metric extraordinaire Ken Pomeroy to create an adjusted conference winning percentage formula that accounted for strength of opponent and location of game. It did its job, but it was scrapped the next season as things more or less returned to normal. Also in 21, the WAC announced they were reviving football and stealing five schools from other conferences to make it happen. They were all supposed to join in 2022, but these four were all from the Southland, who got so mad they basically expelled them on the spot. They all joined a year ahead of schedule, giving the WAC 11 tournament-eligible teams, of which they decided 10 would make the conference tournament. Originally, they planned on making their tournament a standard bracket with two play-in games, but they quickly abandoned that and just went back to the double ladder. A lot of fans hated this in retrospect because the new blood made the WAC stronger than it had been in years, but even so, no no one in the league was in contention for an at-large. The WAC hasn't earned an at-large since 2010, and even then it was by a team that hasn't been with them in a decade. The double ladder made a lot of sense. And as I showed earlier, in this case it led to a good result. 
One seed New Mexico State beat upstart six seed Abilene Christian in the final, got a 12 seed in the NCAA tournament, and went on to upset UConn in the round of 64, the WAC's first tournament win since 2007. Now, obviously, this was a bit of a coincidence given that a top two seed earned the WAC auto bid almost every year they used a standard bracket and they still weren't winning tournament games, but the simple truth is that this format made it easier for the best team to make the tournament and earn the highest possible seed for the WAC. If Abilene Christian wins that game, there's no way they get a 12 seed. Their metrics were more akin to the 14s and 15s that made the field. The same was true for most of the WAC's other auto-bid hopefuls. This, essentially, was the logic of WAC Commissioner Brian Thornton in formulating the league's new tournament format for 2023. A more standard bracket, but seeded by metrics. Like the WCC before him, he hit up Ken Pomeroy to whip up a formula, and that's how we got the WAC resume seeding system. At risk of boring you to sleep with the details, I'll leave a link in the description and just say that under this system, all wins and losses are not treated equally. Wins are always good and losses are always bad, but how much they affect your place in the standings depends on how good the opponent was. This accounts for the WAC's unbalanced conference schedule and helps ensure the best teams get the top seeds in the conference tournament. Not only that, unlike the WCC system in 2021, this one takes the entire regular season into account, not just the conference slate. This is to encourage better non-conference scheduling and give the WAC a better chance at more key wins and higher NCAA tournament seeds. Does it actually work? Eh, jury's still out, I guess. They announced this format in the middle of July, when many teams had already started scheduling, so it'll be hard to say how it truly affects anything until next year. But I'm skeptical that it'll move the needle. Losses can still hurt as much as wins can help, so I could easily see some teams just playing it safe by scheduling easy wins. And as far as I can tell, this system doesn't address the games against opponents from outside Division 1, which WAC teams love to schedule and which metrics routinely ignore. Plus, if you're a good mid-major, scheduling good non-conference opponents is often outside your control. Just this year, we saw Arkansas screw Toledo by reneging on them after a game had already been agreed to in principle. If I was running things, I'd just do what the WCC originally did and use the system to fix imbalances in conference play. But otherwise, I love it. It still allows for the perfect mix of quality and chaos, and I'm excited to see it in action next month. Now imagine if they combined this system with the double ladder. Perhaps in future years we'll see other leagues get more creative. Maybe I won't have to watch a top 100 South Dakota State team, with one of the top 10 scorers in NCAA history, get their dream shattered because they slipped up against a dreadful Western Illinois team that they blew out twice in the regular season. Maybe I won't have to watch the mediocre North Dakota State team who replaced them sputter to a first four win before getting crushed by Duke. The NCAA tournament deserves better. These one-bid leagues deserve better. These teams deserve better. And the double ladder offers a better solution. Thanks for watching. It's good to be back. If you'd like to see more of my work, go check out The Low Major, a blog I run with my friends. Today's its first birthday. Link in the description. You can also subscribe to my Patreon for as little as $3 a video. Have a good day, and see you next time.